Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older, so if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button, and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So if you have not seen my first couple videos of this month, for the entirety of February, I am just going to be covering cases where love went horribly, horribly wrong and it ultimately ended in murder. The case that I'm going to be covering today is one that I recently came across and I knew when I came across it that it was going to be very fitting for this month's theme. It leaves you with a lot of questions. You're wondering, was it actually love at all? How involved was this person? Did this really happen? Was this really said? What exactly went down? A case that genuinely leaves you with more questions than answers, and at the end of it, just like the last case that we covered on my channel, a lot of people think that the main person who was criticized and ultimately is serving time for the crime may have some innocence to them, but whatever opinions that you have that is up for you to form, I'm gonna stop talking now and get right into it. And we're gonna start with the person at the center of all of the controversy, a woman named Celeste Beard. Celeste Beard was born Celeste Johnson in Culver City, California on February 13th of 1963. When it comes to her biological parents, not much is really known about them. She was put up for adoption early on. She met her biological mother once in her life, and when she did, her mother told her, I am not your mother, I am your incubator. So Celeste never had an actual relationship with her parents, and when it comes to her life after being adopted, it was even more tragic. Celeste has made it known that during her teen years, she had attempted suicide due to how horrible her adoptive father, Edwin Johnson, had treated her growing up. At the age of 17, Celeste became pregnant by her first husband, who was a man named Craig Bratcher, and he was allegedly very, very abusive to her. He would end up committing suicide in 1996, but Celeste gave birth to her two daughters. They were twins, the only children that she ever had herself. Their names are Jennifer and Christina. Celeste would be married two more times before meeting her third husband, Stephen Beard, also known as the murder victim of this case. The two met while Celeste was working as a waitress at a country club in Austin, Texas. Stephen Franklin Beard II was a recently widowed father of three adult children, who were Stephen III, Becky, and Paul, who have all since passed away. Stephen's first wife, his only wife, Elise, they had been married since 1948 and she passed away from cancer in 1993, which when you think about it was 15 years before Celeste was even born. So there was a huge age difference there. Stephen was a retired broadcasting executive for Fox, a self-made millionaire. He could financially afford to give Celeste the life that she always desired and more. Stephen was 70 at the time that they met. They tied the knot five days after Celeste's 32nd birthday on February 18th of 1995. Obviously, due to the extreme age difference between them, Stephen's loved ones believed that Celeste primarily married him for his money. As time went on, Celeste's actions would ultimately solidify their fear. Even Celeste's own friends had no idea what attracted her to him besides, of course, his money. Stephen promised to give her everything he could, starting with her dream home, a gorgeous mansion that resides at 3900 Toro Canyon Road in an extremely upscale neighborhood in Austin that some locals refer to as Lexus Land. This is where the two lived during their short marriage. Celeste's teenage daughters, of course, lived with them as well, and Stephen cared for them as his own. This is where the massive amount of spending begins. Celeste was given an allowance of 35 thousand dollars a month from her husband and she was allowed to spend this money any way she chose but she would also spend more than that allowance in one month it is said that there were times where in one day she would spend between fifteen thousand to thirty thousand dollars just in one shopping spree celeste was once quoted saying i could spend it however i wanted I would have diamonds, I had over half a million dollars in jewelry, I had 26 fur coats. He didn't care because he was enjoying his life. If he got mad at me about spending too much money, it didn't last very long. Only a few months into their marriage is when Celeste did something that changed overall how Stephen 
viewed her. This was when Stephen was informed by his banker that his wife had been secretly taking jewelry and silver from his safety deposit box. This jewelry and silver had belonged to Elise, Stephen's deceased wife. This broke Stephen's heart that Celeste would do such a thing. Was the money he gave her just not enough for her? She just had to keep spending and spending so much that she was going to steal from him? He spoiled her and let her do whatever she wanted and it just never seemed like enough. He decided to file for a divorce, but again, this didn't last too long. This was a shock to Celeste at first because she thought she could get away with anything. She apologized profusely and begged for him not to divorce her. The two talked out their differences and Stephen withdrew his petition for the divorce. Things were calm for a while after that, with Celeste, of course, though, continuing her shopping sprees. Stephen would eventually legally adopt Jennifer and Christina in 1998, only a few months shy of their 18th birthday. You might be wondering if they were almost 18, why would he go and legally adopt them? Well, they decided that this would be best, this would be the best option to ensure that Celeste's daughters would inherit equally along with Stephen's biological children. During that same year of 1998 is when Celeste would also sign a marital trust agreement. This marital trust agreement was two things. It was irrevocable, meaning it could never be changed, and it was a tax shelter, meaning it was a financial agreement that would help avoid or minimize how much taxes someone had to pay. Due to this agreement, Celeste was given two houses and the allowance was changed to no more monthly allowance, but $500,000 that she could tap into at any time. But Stephen had to approve all of her spending, which no matter what she wanted to buy, he would always approve. It is said that the $500,000 was gone in six months. During this time, if something happened to Stephen, Stephen's estate was set to be split 50-50 between Celeste, she would get 50%, and all of his children, which was his three and then also Celeste two. Aspects of this would change though during the next year, but we'll get to that. So as you can tell, their marriage was not a perfect one and it most certainly, at least in the majority's opinion, was not built on love. It is said that Celeste had multiple lovers on the side and that Stephen had a drinking problem. Allegedly, Celeste would tell people she knew that she despised her husband, how he absolutely disgusted her. People saw that maybe he did disgust her, but his money did not. So she stayed in a shallow marriage based on no love. Celeste suffered from an addiction to shopping, that's for sure, but she also suffered from depression. This is known, especially due to her traumatic childhood. The overwhelming hopelessness never truly left her, which of course is sad. She always had this melancholy that followed her around like a shadow. Due to that and being in an unhappy marriage, even though she chose to stay in it, according to Celeste, she decided to check herself into a mental health facility in 1999 because of all this. She stayed at St. David's Pavilion in Austin and went for suicidal thoughts as a result of this depression. When going through mental health issues, sometimes you will cling to others going through something similar mentally. It makes you feel less alone. This is a fact, especially when you may be surrounded in life by people who just don't seem to get it. So while staying at St. David's Pavilion for a few weeks, she met a friend, a woman named Tracy Tarleton, who was in the facility at the time for alcoholism. This is something that she suffered from for a very long time. Tracy was the manager of a local bookstore in Austin called Book People, and she was a proud lesbian woman. Celeste and Tracy hit it off immediately and decided that they would continue their friendship after they were discharged, which they did, and they spent a lot of time together. So much that people started questioning the true nature of their relationship. The thing is though, that their relationship or degree of relationship was and is perceived differently by different people involved and different people who knew them. To make it short and sweet, Tracy stated, and states still to this day, that she and Celeste had a romantic relationship, even being intimate on multiple occasions, with Tracy stating that Celeste even came into her room while they were at the mental health facility and kissed her. That after that kiss, they began a secret affair. Celeste's own daughters claimed that the two were certainly more than friends, that they even walked in on them once 
kissing. That Stephen once also saw them kissing at a barbecue and ordered Tracy to leave the property immediately. Celeste told ABC News that she wasn't kissing Tracy, that Tracy merely attempted to kiss her. One story that was even brought up in court was that Tracy tried to kiss Celeste once while she was passed out at her daughter's high school graduation party in 1999. There are a lot of these he said, she said stories involving kissing. It's all over the place. I don't know which ones are fact, which ones are fiction, who's telling the truth. It was also brought up in court that once Tracy had been arrested for drunk driving, Celeste had bailed her out of jail and that after that, Tracy just kept calling the family home. She just wouldn't stop calling, I guess, because Celeste did this for her. She had more of a attraction to her and this irritated Steven to no end and he told her that she needed to stop calling the home and that they needed to just stop seeing each other altogether. He was getting a very strange feeling about what was going on and he felt like something was going on behind his back. A coworker of Tracy's named Brandy Witten was quoted saying, they would gaze at each other lovingly and it wasn't the kind of affection that platonic girlfriends would share. They were very affectionate together. At one point, Celeste was sitting on Tracy's lap and I saw Celeste nuzzle Tracy's ear. Celeste even bought Tracy a card that said, to the one I love. Another fellow employee of Tracy's at the bookstore, Jeremy Ellis, was quoted saying, Tracy wasn't secretive. Everyone in the store knew she was dating someone named Celeste. She spoke about her like she was her girlfriend. They were sort of physical, close with each other, and I thought, well, good for Tracy. Celeste claimed, and still claims, though to this day, that Tracy was simply confused and obsessed with her, that the two had never been sexually active in any way, and that she never gave her the wrong idea, that they were only ever just friends. She's really the main one who sticks by this though, except of course her attorney who was paid to back up her story. So a little time goes by and Celeste and Steven had been planning a trip to Europe, but the morning before they were set to leave, tragedy struck the Beard home. On October 2nd of 1999, at three o'clock in the morning, while Steven Beard was sound asleep in his bed, he was shot in his stomach by a 20 gauge shotgun. They knew this because they found a shotgun shell on the floor of the bedroom. Stephen didn't die as a direct result of this. He was actually able to call for help himself. He told the 911 operator that his guts just jumped out of his stomach, that he was basically sitting in bed holding his guts. Authorities rushed over to the home. An ambulance was there to take him to the hospital immediately. Authorities noted though, how odd Celeste was acting when they got there. She had been sleeping in a separate bedroom that night, so she wasn't in the bedroom when her husband was shot. Sergeant Greg Truitt reported that Celeste said, this is perfect timing. We were supposed to go to Europe tomorrow. A peculiar thing to say by a woman whose husband was just shot and everyone is unsure if he's going to make it or not. Steven stayed in the hospital for a few months. He hadn't got a look at who shot him, so he had no idea, but during questioning, Jennifer told authorities that she knew someone with a 20 gauge shotgun, which was her mother's friend, her mother's very close friend, Tracy. Tracy was arrested for the shooting six days after it happened. While in intensive care, Stephen's attorney, David Cooperman, who was also an attorney for the Bank of America, came to him to make an amendment to the marital trust agreement. It is stated that he placed phase one and phase two of the upscale Davenport Village shopping centers that Stephen built into the marital trust agreement. So you couldn't change the marital trust agreement, but you could add things to it. I'm guessing that this was done because Stephen wasn't in the best shape health-wise, and they just wanted to make sure everything was in order in case something happened to him. Steven signed the papers and ultimately changed his will. As a part of this new agreement, he would be putting 20 million extra dollars of his assets into the marital trust agreement, which would all go to Celeste. By doing this, there would only be $230,000 going for the five children in the children's trust agreement. All five children, the three of Stevens and also Celeste's daughters, were infuriated by this. Yes, $230,000 is a lot of money, but again, it would be split five ways and look at how much 
Celeste was getting. It is said that Stephen's children called him and left messages on his answering machine blaming Celeste for the new changes and calling her horrible names. As a result, Stephen became angry with them. He was sticking up for his wife. He canceled their flights to Austin. They were supposed to be coming in for Thanksgiving that year and he called them and told them that he had no interest in speaking to them anymore. His three children just could not believe what was going on. They were flabbergasted and they blamed Celeste, but Celeste said that she had no part of this, that his attorney came to him without her knowledge. Stephen had an extreme amount of internal bleeding, but he was stable enough to be released to go home. They truly thought that he was going to pull through and survive the attack. He was put in the care of Celeste back home. After this, Stephen was doing a bit better, but his close call with death changed him mentally. He wanted to start living his life to the fullest before his time was up. So it was said that he started spending money just like his wife did, if not worse. On top of it all, he was spoiling Celeste even more than before. They were spending thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars pretty much every single day. On January 22nd of 2000 though, at 75 years old, Stephen Beard passed away from a blood clot said to ultimately be a result of the shooting months prior, but we'll discuss that more very soon. He would be laid to rest at Cook Walden Capital Park's cemetery and mausoleum, where he is interred next to his first wife. About his death, Celeste was quoted saying, I was beside myself because I did not see that coming. My whole world just ended right there. After he died, even though it was months later, now they had a murder on their hands. I do want to state though, and most of this information right here comes from a website that is for a fair trial for Celeste, a retrial. But like always, I like to bring up every side and kind of show you information that may not be in say an article or documentary that is very biased. I like to just pick things from all over. There is speculation as to whether the clot was actually a later result of the shooting. It is said that the autopsy showed that the gunshot was mostly healed at the time of his death. So this is something that the autopsy said. The state's medical examiner stated during the trial that Stephen most likely got the clot as a result of barely being mobile after the shooting. The truth is though that even before the shooting, and this is backed up by many people, that Stephen didn't walk most places. He was either driven around or he just didn't go because he didn't want to do much walking. He also used a wheelchair for a period of time. This in no way, shape or form, excuses the shooting. This does not. But they are not entirely sure, and a lot of people question this, if the actual clot that killed him was a later result of the shooting. And by of the shooting, I mean the fact that he was so immobile because the fact that he was shot. The defense medical examiner also stated that Stephen had blood clots present from before the shooting. And Stephen had also been suffering from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, which refers to a group of diseases that cause airflow, blockage, and breathing related problems. Basically, he hadn't been in the best health for a while, and even his physician testified that he suffered from pulmonary issues since the 1980s. Stephen had also been quite overweight for much of his adult life, and this is something to also take into consideration. Again, not excusing the shooting itself. It is said that Stephen had actually been found unconscious on the floor on September 12th of 1999 and was sent to the hospital. Then again, he was found on the 15th of September slumped over on a table and was again sent to the hospital. This was weeks before the shooting took place. Stephen had been in and out of the hospital and in a rehab center for a period of time. It is stated that at the beginning of the rehab program that Stephen was walking around some, but by the end of it, he didn't really want to. It is believed by many professionals that Stephen was going to die eventually due to pulmonary embolism or COPD. That even if he had not been shot, a fatal blood clot could have formed and taken his life eventually. Because somebody cannot see into another timeline, they were never able to 100% prove this. His previous health issues were not taken into consideration when determining his cause of death. If they had been, could his cause of death been different? We don't know. 
but the overall consensus was that the clot must have been an eventual result of the shooting by Tracy Tarleton. Due to that, it is considered a murder case. While Tracy sat behind bars, staying pretty much silent as to why she did what she did, originally denying she even shot him to begin with, Celeste, a supposedly grieving widow, spent time traveling, partying, and eventually remarried about five months after Stephen's death to a man named Cole Johnson. After Tracy read in the paper about the new marriage, she changed her mind on protecting Celeste. In exchange for testifying against Celeste, she made a deal with prosecutors that she would only be given 20 years behind bars for the supposedly fatal shooting of Stephen Beard. This is when Tracy started talking after she realized that her relationship with Celeste was rubbish. Now, when Tracy was asked why she did what she did, she said that she did it for Celeste. Tracy started telling authorities her side of the story. She claimed that she became very close to Celeste, that they had formed a deep romantic relationship together, and that Celeste confided in her how mistreated she was by her husband, that he belittled her, broke her down almost daily, and that Celeste felt like he was going to push her to suicide, which is why she went to the mental health facility. That Celeste told her that the only way that they could ever be together is if Steven was out of the picture, if they got rid of him. So Tracy shot him with the hopes that he would die and that they could be together, but he didn't die, not until months later. After this statement, Celeste was arrested on March 28th of 2002, with Celeste denying and still denying everything that Tracy told authorities and would end up testifying in court. The lead prosecutor was Allison Weitzel, and in her opening statement, she said she couldn't stand Steve Beard. She talked to people about how she hated him. He disgusted her. What happened here is a simple case of a greedy, manipulative defendant who took advantage of a mentally ill woman who was in love with her. She told Tracy that with Steve gone, they could be together. Celeste's attorney, Dick DeGuerin, retaliated during the trial saying, this is a case of fatal attraction. It's a case of obsession. Tracy Tarleton is psychotic. She's been diagnosed as having delusions, as hearing voices that aren't there, as seeing things that aren't there. That was basically the two sides of the story and this is how the story still is to this day all these years later. There are just two sides. Tracy was asked why Celeste did not just divorce her husband if she had been so insanely unhappy. Tracy said that Celeste made it seem like she was stuck. Tracy said that Celeste told her that she was scared to divorce him, that he would hunt her down, that he was a very powerful man, that she could never get out from under him. Tracy said that she felt like Celeste depended on her and that she needed her. And that, of course, attracted her even more to Celeste because she wanted to be her protector. Actor. Tracy felt like she could save her and get her out of this dreadful situation that she was in and that they could live happily ever after. Tracy said that during their relationship, Celeste told her of all the ways she would knock out her husband so that she could get time away from him. Tracy said that it was known that Stephen drank a lot of vodka. Celeste though would pour out the vodka and put another clear liquor in the bottle, a much stronger one, ever clear. This would have him passing out much sooner. That Celeste would also crush up sleeping pills and give them to him on the regular, mostly in his food. Her daughter Jennifer even stated that she saw her mother crush up sleeping pills and put them in his baked potato once. Tracy said that Celeste had told her about the Europe trip. She said that she was crying, saying that she couldn't survive another trip with him. That at that point, Tracy felt like she had to take things into her own hands and save the woman that she loved, that it was time to finally kill Stephen Beard. Tracy said, that gun was given to me by my father who had had it engraved for me. It has my name on it. I had stepped into a space that was just numb when I went into that bedroom and I shot him. Tracy said, when I started realizing Celeste had been lying to me all along, that this man was not abusing her, that she had married him for his money, that she had been lying to me about our relationship, 
all of it was a farce. I think she manipulated me from the beginning. When Tracy took the stand, Celeste's attorney, Dick DeGuerin, surprised Tracy a bit by bringing forth something she never expected, which was her private journal. His point of doing this was to show everyone in the court that Tracy never once wrote anything in her journal about ever officially having sexual relations with Celeste. If they were this couple that she thought they were for this period of time, where is her juicy journal entry about finally getting Celeste in bed? She admitted though that there wasn't one. Even though she wrote about so many things in her life, she never wrote about a sexual encounter with the person that she was supposedly in a relationship with. Now Tracy, in her own words, stated that Celeste wanted her to shoot Steven that there was a plan, that it was supposed to happen at the Toro Canyon home, and it was supposed to be done with Tracy's shotgun. Celeste, though, denies this and has stated that she does not know why Tracy ever shot her husband. Now, a woman named Katina Lofton claimed that she knew why Tracy said all of this to authorities and randomly changed her story. Katina had shared a cell with Tracy in jail for two months and said that Tracy loved Celeste but Celeste did not love Tracy, and that after hearing of Celeste remarrying, she was angry and wasn't going to let the love of her life live happily ever after with somebody else while she rotted behind bars. This testimony of Katina's gave Celeste some hope during the trial, but it was the testimonies of her children that tore her apart. Both Jennifer and Christina testified, and they had a lot to say, that their mother lied a lot, that she only married Stephen for money, that she never loved him, called him names behind his back, that their mother would drug Stephen and then sneak out of the home to hang out with Tracy, that they always questioned how intense the relationship between Tracy and Celeste really was, and they just went on and on with the stories. Celeste would later say, I just can't imagine any child getting up on the stand and being able to do that to their mother. Obviously, I was a horrible mother. I mean, I have to admit that because my kids wouldn't be like they are today if I wasn't a bad mother. But I did the best I knew how. Going on to say, they're the ones that talked behind his back. They hated Stephen. They thought he was old. They thought he was no fun. I used to beg them, call him dad. He would love for you to call him dad. And they refused. I have to admit it. But the only reason why they could have turned on me was for the money. I mean, I have to face that fact. Could testifying against their mother get them more money? Well, from what I read, it was said that if she was convicted, that they would both get a share of her inheritance, which was about $2 million each. Yes, that would be a reason to, but is it really the reason they did it? The lead prosecutor, Allison Weitzel, said, I do not agree for a minute that they're motivated by money. I think those girls, the growing up they had to do with the defendant is just something that's almost too horrible to imagine. In court, a recording was played of a phone conversation between Christina and Celeste. Christina, at a point, started recording phone calls between her and her mother that she deemed abusive. During these phone calls that she was having with her mother on the regular, she was realizing that her mother was saying some horrible things. One of those times was when Celeste told her daughter that she hired someone to kill Tracy. Christina said, the day she told me about Tracy, I knew. You only want someone dead because maybe you put them up to it. And I thought, I know now she's guilty. I had to separate myself from her. It was hard. Celeste claimed that these audio recordings were clipped together a certain way to make her look worse. The jurors though were completely shocked by what they heard in the courtroom. It would take them 72 hours to settle on a final verdict. In 2003, at the end of the trial, Celeste was found guilty of capital murder and received a mandatory life sentence under the Texas Law of Parties. She is currently being held at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice and will be eligible for parole on April 1st of 2042. Tracy received a sentence reduced by 10 years for testifying against Celeste. She was paroled in 2011 and currently lives in San Antonio, Texas. And if you're wondering, 
sharing some things that she's been up to since she was put behind bars. She received her associate's degree in prison and released a cookbook in 2010 with fellow prisoners called From the Big House to Your House, where they shared recipes from prison they make with the limited cooking ingredients that they have on hand. Many different forms of media have been released regarding this case. The first episode of Snapped highlighted the case. There has been an episode of Deadly Women covering the case, 2020, Vengeance, Killer Millionaires, and Reasonable Doubt. A biography called The Celeste Beard Johnson Story was released in 2019. In 2021, Lifetime aired a made-for-TV movie called Secrets of a Gold Digger Killer. In 2022 though, ABC released a two-part episode called What the Sisters Saw as a part of the documentary series, Who Do You Believe? And it features interviews with both Jennifer, Christina, and others involved in the case. The twins still stick by their original stories. The two live rather quiet lives. Neither of them really seem to be fans of being in the spotlight, especially after everything that happened with their mother. They have done quite a few interviews though, just to get their sides of the story across. We do know that tragedy struck one of the twins again during the year of 2017. Jennifer attended a Halloween party and at this Halloween party, she and two others were shot by Jennifer's then roommate, a man named Randall Jones. One of the victims did not survive, unfortunately. Jennifer would end up needing 10 surgeries and still faces struggles today. And the last thing that I saw is that she is physically unable to work still because of the shooting. So Christina has financially helped her a lot because of that. Other than that though, very little is known about their personal lives. During their 2020 interview, they stated that growing up with Celeste was unstable, that they would get dropped off at foster homes at times and not even understand why. Christina said that there were times that she was nice, but you didn't know what was going to happen next. She told of one time that Celeste went and got a gun and started waving it around like anyone in the room, the twins or Steven, were fair game. Like she was just going to shoot any of them right then and there. They have made it known that they never wanted to testify against their mother, but they only did it so that there would be justice served for Steven. Celeste has made it known that she feels hurt by the fact that her daughters testified against her. She even called them the Menendez sisters, which is a reference to Lyle and Eric Menendez, the brothers who were convicted in 1996 of murdering their parents. On the site though, that I discussed before that backs up Celeste in Celeste's own words, she writes about her daughters. I know that I wasn't the perfect mother. For that matter, I had a lot to learn as a mother as I navigated through life. There can be no excuses for my absence and carelessness as your mother and our resulting ultimate denial of mother and friend. But nothing will ever change that I have children that I love and that I continue to live every moment with the desire of being part of your lives forever. There is nothing we can do to reverse the past, but I hope and pray in my lifetime that we will reunite again. The last thing that I have come across is that her daughters told ABC that they do not forgive their mother. This is definitely one of those cases where you just kind of wish you were a fly on the wall to know exactly what went down. Do we think that Celeste completely led Tracy on or did they just have an extremely close friendship and Tracy took it too far? Was money the motive because it just never seemed to be enough for Celeste and she wanted the money that her husband would leave her behind if he passed away? Should Tracy have gotten more time because she's the one who pulled the trigger? At the end of the day, many lives were horrifically affected by this tragedy and that is what we have to remember. If you like this video and you wanna see more from me, again, make sure to click that subscribe button. And I hope you all are having a fabulous day. Stay safe, always stay safe. And I will see you all in the next one.